This is a video about whiteness. Because to many white people, myself very much included, whiteness is often entirely invisible. Or to put it another way, we rarely think about what it means to be white. White people on our TV screens and in our books are generally framed merely as the norm or the default. In contrast to black people, indigenous people and people of colour, we're often framed as being entirely defined by their race. Our cultural texts, our media discourse and our educational curricula thus tacitly encourage us to view whiteness as the absence of race. Other people have racial identities, we don't. As a consequence, we're rarely encouraged to think about the ways in which whiteness structures our lives and the impact that it has on others. The murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor by US police officers in recent months and the ongoing bravery of the Black Lives Matter movement both in the US and across the world, however, has forced many white people who might usually engage little with discussion surrounding race to begin to reckon with the huge impact that it has on the organisation of our society. These heinous acts, merely the latest of many, remind us that racism and anti-blackness do not solely reside in the use of slurs or bad taste jokes, but that racism is a system which guides the priorities of our most powerful institutions, including the state and the police, but also our education systems, our cultural institutions, our media outlets and more. For white people, part of confronting that system has to involve confronting whiteness, learning to recognise that race is present, even in situations where we've learned to view it as absent. This video then is primarily addressed to my fellow white people. For as Sarah Ahmed has written, whiteness is only invisible to those who inhabit it. For those who don't, it is hard not to see whiteness. It even seems everywhere. If you're black, indigenous or a person of colour, there's going to be little that's new to you in here. In fact, if there's one thing that I hope comes across from this brief overview of whiteness, it is that it is usually best understood from the perspective of those outside of it. If there's only one of my videos which leads to you going and doing some further reading on a topic, then please let it be this one. Because if we want to be good allies, to engage in good allyship in the anti-racist struggle, then it's important that us white people begin to try and recognise the unacknowledged presence of whiteness in our politics, our culture and in our everyday lives. In order to discuss whiteness, we first need to have a basic understanding of what race is. And the first step in doing so is to recognise race as being socially constructed. Certainly, people exhibit different skin tones and other physical characteristics, and these features are more or less pronounced depending on the places in which one's ancestors lived, how long they lived there for, and who they decided to procreate with. Nevertheless, our ancestors all ultimately came from Africa, and it's estimated that, on a genetic level, we still share 99.9% .9 of our DNA with every single other person on the planet. There is no biological rationale for grouping people solely based on the colour of their skin. By saying that race is socially constructed then, we mean that race only means something because of the meanings that society has placed upon it. What race is assumed to mean has thus changed and continues to change over time and across geography. In ancient times, for instance, Paul C. Taylor writes that while the world was for many of its inhabitants a world of multiple peoples, often enough these people were sorted into two sets, us and them. Groups of people certainly saw themselves as distinct from one another, yet the concept of race as it exists in the present day would have been simply incomprehensible to them. Our modern understanding of race is primarily a consequence of colonialism. As I explore at greater length in my video on colonialism itself, European nations who were discovering new lands needed a rationale for exploiting the resources and the people that they encountered there. They therefore drew upon cultural differences between themselves and those living in the places they had discovered in order to argue that they were not simply invading and or pillaging, but were instead bringing civilization to uncivilised peoples. This went even further when it came to European nations enslaving people from the African continent. 
Many of those engaged in slavery believed themselves to be good Christians, and it wouldn't have been very Christian to kidnap and force one's peers into bondage. So again, cultural differences were drawn upon to categorise those that they were turning into property and subjecting to a life of brutality as in some way less than human. It was slightly later, during the Enlightenment, that clear taxonomies of race began to emerge. Angela Saini writes that what Europeans saw as cultural shortcomings in other populations in the early 19th century soon became conflated with how they looked. So called race scientists thus began drawing on both cultural and physical differences between groups of people in order to argue that the human race might, in fact, be made up of multiple races. Saini points to German doctor Johann Friedrich Blumenbach's 1795 treatise on the natural variety of mankind as a key text in this process. Blumenbach posited that humanity could, in fact, be divided into five discrete racial groups – Caucasians, Mongolians, Ethiopians, Americans, and Malays. Notably, Blumenbach did not use the term Caucasian in its geographical sense to refer to those living in the Caucasus region between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, but instead to refer to pretty much everyone from Europe, India, and North Africa. He stated that he did so because its neighbourhood, and especially its southern slope, produces the most beautiful race of men. This was not only a categorisation of humans into racial groups then, but the articulation of a racial hierarchy, with white people placed firmly at the top. Our everyday understanding of race is thus not the product of nature, but of society. It was invented and it was invented by rich white people to provide a rationale for the colonisation and enslavement of other human beings. Skin colour and cultural differences were used as the basis for suggesting that black people, indigenous people, and people of colour were in some way lesser, and thus deserved or needed to be treated in such a way. To talk about race, then, is always to talk about power and to engage in a discourse which has always, at a very fundamental level, served to empower white people and disenfranchise all others. In the present day, claims of the kind that Blumenbach made about the supposed unmatched beauty of the white race tend to be confined to the fringes of polite discussion. Yet, this does not mean that the notion of a racial hierarchy has disappeared. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, the language of race continues to permeate mainstream discourse, but it is usually only invoked with reference to black people, indigenous people, and people of colour. White people, by contrast, are framed merely as the norm. As Richard Dyer writes in his 1997 book White, at the level of representation, whites are not of a certain race, they are just the human race. And this way of thinking is equally as hierarchical as the models foregrounded by the race scientists of the 19th century. For, as Dyer continues, there is no more powerful position than that of being just human. The claim to power is the claim to speak for the commonality of humanity. Raced people can't do that. They can only speak for their race. But non-raced people can, for they do not represent the interests of a race. Now, the greatest impact that this has is obviously upon those who are written out of the definition of what it means to be human. Those who are considered to be human, but with qualifiers attached. A further consequence, however, is that in not seeing ourselves as white, white people are often allowed to remain ignorant of the ways in which we benefit from being so. And it allows us to also remain ignorant of how we benefit from racist structures. Robin D'Angelo uses the term white fragility to refer to the reaction that many white people have when we're encouraged to recognise ourselves as white and to recognise the impact that this might have had on our lives. She argues that a mere suggestion that being white has meaning often triggers a range of defensive responses, 
These include emotions such as anger, fear and guilt, and behaviours such as argumentation, silence and withdrawal from the stress-inducing situation. These responses work to reinstate white equilibrium as they repel the challenge, return our racial comfort and maintain our dominance within the racial hierarchy. In recent weeks, several clips from documentaries featuring the anti-racist educator Jane Elliott have been circulating on social media. Elliott's Blue Eyes, Brown Eyes exercise works by dividing a group up by eye colour and treating them differently in order to open up a conversation about racism. Whether placed in the empowered group or the disempowered one, at least a portion of the white participants consistently react with the kind of responses which D'Angelo describes as white fragility. They tense up, are hostile, or simply decide to leave. On the political left, many might be more willing to recognise that race plays a huge role in determining the opportunities that an individual gets in life. Nevertheless, the argument often circulates that it is unproductive to focus too heavily on race. I know that I have often reacted to discussions of racial inequality in this way, and argued that our focus should be on rethinking economic structures. If we can dismantle class distinctions, I've suggested, then race will naturally disintegrate along with it. This, however, is far from a certainty, and on reflection was an acute example of white fragility. An attempt to disavow my own whiteness and to excuse myself from discussions surrounding race. To discuss whiteness is thus to see race in places we have become accustomed to ignoring it. To recognise whiteness as a racial category. As John Hartigan Jr. writes, whiteness asserts the obvious but consistently overlooked fact that whites are racially interested and motivated. Whiteness both names and critiques hegemonic beliefs and practices that designate white people as normal and racially unmarked. Hartigan's book Odd Tribes and Dyer's book White, which I mentioned a moment ago, both seek to analyse films and other cultural representations in a way that acknowledges white characters not as raceless, but as white. The more pressing work, however, is to view ourselves as white, and to consider the ways in which whiteness structures our lives and provides us with benefits not afforded to others. Perhaps the phrase that most people will be familiar with when it comes to discussing whiteness is white privilege. Even if not described using these exact words, the concept of white privilege has a long history in writing about race. In his 1935 book Black Reconstruction in America, for instance, W. E. B. Du Bois wrote that the white group of labourers, while they received a low wage, were compensated in part by a sort of public and psychological wage. They were given public deference and titles of courtesy because they were white. He lists several ways in which the low wages of white working class people are essentially topped up by this psychological wage, which manifests in our ability to see others with the same skin colour as ourselves in positions of power and our access to preferential treatment. In the 1960s, Theodore W. Allen and Noel Ignatin began to write of what they called white skin privileges, referencing one of the closing lines of the Communist Manifesto, which claims that the working class have nothing to lose but their chains. Ignatin wrote that white workers do have more to lose than their chains. They have also to lose their white skin privileges, the perquisites that separate them from the rest of the working class. Allen and Ignatin thus recognise that whiteness comes with certain benefits and that this allows white working class people to see themselves as separate from the rest of the working class in a way that gives us a certain investment in the status quo. Yes, we might want to be rewarded with the full value of our labour, but we also might not want to risk losing out on our white privilege. The most regularly cited articulation of white privilege in the present day is that provided by Peggy McIntosh in her 1989 article, White Privilege, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. McIntosh writes that, I have come to see white privilege as an invisible package of unearned assets that I can count on cashing in each day, but about which I was meant to remain oblivious. White privilege is like an invisible, weightless knapsack of special provisions, maps, 
maps, passports, code books, visas, clothes, tools, and blank checks. Macintosh's use of travel-based analogies is useful, I think, as it can be tempting to want to respond to the notion that one has white privilege by suggesting that we don't feel all that privileged. Macintosh, however, envisages white privilege as less a series of perks than an ability to move unrestricted, to pass through barriers that black people, indigenous people, and people of colour might be stopped at. Macintosh gives 26 non-exhaustive examples of conditions which she sees as being part of white privilege. These include number six. When I am told about our national heritage or about civilization, I am shown that people of my colour made it what it is. Number 15. I am never asked to speak for all the people of my racial group. And number 22. I can take a job with an affirmative action employer without having co-workers on the job suspect that I got it because of race. The attributes which constitute white privilege then vary from the ideological and cultural, being able to see oneself reflected in the official history of one's nation, for instance, to the routine and every day. The ability to be seen as a legitimate employee who has gained their position on merit. Where discussions surrounding whiteness have broken into the mainstream discourse in recent years, a great deal of emphasis has been put on white people recognising our white privilege. And to do so can evidently be a productive first step in engaging in anti-racism. It's important to recognise that it is only that, however, a first step. Sarah Ahmed has critiqued the way in which recognising and admitting to one's white privilege can be used as a way of positioning ourselves as not part of the problem. She writes that declaring whiteness or even admitting to one's own racism when the declaration is assumed to be evidence of an anti-racist commitment does not do what it says. In short, neither the recognition nor the declaration change anything in and of themselves. Even worse, Ahmed suggests that there is a danger that we might overly focus on our own internal process of coming to terms with our white privilege in a way that re-centres our own trauma, sadness, or shame, turning a discussion which was meant to be about anti-racism into one about the emotions of white people. Ahmed thus argues that, to be of any use, discussions of whiteness must involve a double turn. To turn towards whiteness is to turn towards and away from those bodies who have been afforded agency and mobility by such privilege. In other words, the task for white subjects would be to stay implicated in what they critique, but in turning towards their role and responsibility in these histories of racism as histories of the present, to turn away from themselves and towards the other. In order to productively contribute to the anti-racist struggle then, our critique of whiteness needs to not foreground the experiences of white people, but to consider the impact that our culture's normalisation of whiteness has on black people, indigenous people, and people of colour. Following a similar line of thinking, Charles W. Mills argues that we would benefit from talking less about white privilege than white supremacy. Unlike the currently more fashionable white privilege, he writes, white supremacy implies the existence of a system that not only privileges whites, but is run by whites for white benefit. Where discussions of white privilege generally focus on the complicity or resistance of white individuals within an assumed racist system, Mill's conceptualization of white supremacy as a socio-political system, similar in many ways to other sociological structures such as Marx's articulation of the class society or the feminist articulation of the patriarchy, invites us to comprehend the underlying system itself. To Mills, the term white supremacy refers to a social and political system which serves to benefit white people at the expense of black people, indigenous people, and people of colour. And Mills identifies six dimensions through which it operates. The first is the juridicio political sphere, the ways in which white supremacy is upheld through politics, the creation of laws, and their implementation through the justice system. 
In the present day, this might be less explicit than it has been in the past, but it might refer to gerrymandering or voter registration practices which disproportionately disenfranchise black people, indigenous people and people of colour. It might also refer to the over-policing of black neighbourhoods, police violence or the disproportionate incarceration of black people, indigenous people and people of colour. The second is the economic sphere. This might include the ways in which recruitment processes can lead to people with white sounding names being more likely to be invited to interview, as numerous studies have shown. It might also involve the ethnic pay gap. In the UK, for instance, the average black male graduate earns on average 17% less than a white man with the same qualifications. It also might include whether a bank is more willing to lend a business loan to a white business owner than to one who is black, indigenous or a person of colour. The third is the cultural sphere. This might include the continued invocation of racial stereotypes in films, TV shows and books and the continued framing of white people as the default or the norm in such work. It might include the fact that films helmed by black directors, say, or starring black actors continue to be far rarer than those led by white creatives. They are also often positioned by reviewers and publicists as black films rather than just films. We might also look at the ways in which our history is told, with the achievements of white people usually placed front and centre and those of black people, indigenous people and people of colour either ignored entirely or framed as marginal or of lesser importance to the human story. The fourth is the cognitive evaluative sphere. This is slightly more complex to understand but focuses on the ways in which our systems of knowledge function to centralise white experience. It also highlights the prioritisation of characteristically white ways of thinking about and acting in the world. Black people, indigenous people and people of colour are thus tacitly forced to adopt white ways of thinking and behaving if they are to succeed in a white-centred society. The fifth is the somatic sphere. This refers to how we view differently racialised bodies. A key aspect might be how we envisage beauty. Our society generally upholds notions of beauty which are heavily rooted in whiteness. The 2016 report, for instance, found that 78% of models featured in US fashion adverts were white. White bodies are thus framed as an ideal which people of all races should try to emulate. The final dimension of Mill's articulation of white supremacy is the metaphysical sphere. This dimension is acutely philosophical and refers to the way in which our very concept of humanity continues to be seen as fundamentally white. Again, to be white is to be human. To be black, indigenous or a person of colour is to be human with a qualifier attached. Mills' conceptualisation of white supremacy as a socio-political system is a great deal more daunting than Macintosh's fairly individualist notion of white privilege or D'Angelo's white fragility. But that is because racism and anti-blackness are daunting. They are all-encompassing systems which structure every aspect of our society. From a practical standpoint though, Mill's conceptualisation of white supremacy perhaps suffers from the opposite problem than that of Macintosh and D'Angelo's work, where the former were highly individualistic in a way that sometimes obscures the systemic nature of whiteness and white supremacy, the notion of white supremacy as a structure has the potential to make us feel powerless to do anything about it. Yet, I think we can usefully pair the two approaches together and consider the ways in which our individual actions might contribute to the strengthening or weakening of that system. This might include thinking about where our votes go and which campaigns and demonstrations we turn up to support, including when it is difficult and unpopular to do so as well as when it is front page news. But it also might include where we spend our money, whose voices and stories we choose to listen to and which we choose to amplify. Part of this comes from learning to see whiteness, beginning to look around a room or at a TV schedule or at a core syllabus and, if they're dominated by white people, not see the absence of race but the active presence of white supremacy. For my part, I've recently been looking back at the topics that I've covered on this channel and the sea of white faces which comprise the scholars that I've created introductory videos to the work of.
in the past, I've blamed this on the education that I've received and my desire to make videos which the people who engage with my content might be seeking out. To do so, however, is to ignore the responsibility which comes with having such a platform, the gaining of which has undoubtedly been easier because of my whiteness, the responsibility to challenge the way in which black and indigenous scholars and scholars of colour are pushed to the margins of white academia. Thinking critically about whiteness is thus highly complex and contested. In some of its forms, it can be counterproductive. It can prioritise declarations of white privilege over taking meaningful action, or it can serve to recenter the guilt and shame of white people in conversations about anti-racism. As Sarah Ahmed has written then, to be of any use, critically engaging with whiteness and white supremacy has to involve not just recognising our own privilege, but seeing that as a precursor to engaging with the ideas, perspective and calls to action of those who are denied it. It has to involve both seeing white supremacy as systemic, but also recognising our own place within that system and finding ways to use our position within it to seek change. I'll include a list of all the scholars that I've cited in this video uh, down in the description. If you want to read further, and I very much think you should, then there also exist several accessible books aimed at white people who want to consider how they might contribute to the anti-racist struggle in some way. Uh, I'm currently reading Reniedo Lodge's Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race, uh, Leila Saeed's Me and White Supremacy, which is more of a book that you sort of work through, and Ibram X Kendo's How to Be an Anti-Racist, and um, finding those really invigorating and challenging in just the way that they need to be. Finally, I'm going to donate any ad revenue that this video makes along with some of my Patreon support from this month uh, to the Free Black University Fund, which is focusing on decolonization efforts within UK universities, as well as supporting black scholars more broadly. If you'd like to join me in supporting their work, then I'll pop a link to that in the description too. Thanks as ever to Ash, to Michael V. Brown, to J. Fraser Cartwright, to Army of Me, to Richard and to Kaya Lau for being signed up to the top tier of my Patreon. Uh, thanks again for watching and have a great week.